a long time ago that I picked up on this week when I was with my brother and I asked Sharon if we could sing it today and uh, we practiced it last night. Since I'm not used to singing, you're going to get what you get. <laughs> But from my heart, this song says what I feel. Unfailing love flows from his heart and heals my soul. In spite of who I am, he loves and makes me whole. Sometimes I can't believe it's so. But what I know is his unfailing love heals me. Every day, all the way, he heals me. Now that's not the way the course goes, totally, but uh, <laughs> we're going to sing it together. Just sit where you are. If you know it, sing it. We'll sing it through a couple of times. And I want you to get used to this chorus. I want you to be singing it at home when you're not thinking about anything really except it just pours out of you. All right? Yeah. 
If you want to turn your Bibles to Acts 15, I'm going to read there in a few moments, the first 11 verses, and share with you. Thank you. Again, from that theme, the book of Acts, the church, and the Great Commission. What are we doing about the Great Commission? I hope it matches what the early church did in these passages that I'm sharing with you. In verse 1, it says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. I want you to underline the last part of that ninth verse. Purifying their hearts by faith. <clears throat> now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. I want to, want to talk today about purifying faith. It, it is really the only kind of faith. But it does work. And Peter cites that here about what happened to the Gentile believers that their hearts were purified not by keeping the law or circumcision but by purifying faith, by faith. In Jewish practice there were many rituals and observances that had to be kept. The law of Moses required observance to keep many things. These practices and the observance of them by adherence to the Jewish religion prove or purify the intent and the content of their hearts. Circumcision was one of the Jewish rituals that became an issue in the early church. Acts 15 has given us detail of the conflict and also how it was resolved. In Acts 15, a conflict arose about Gentile converts following the Jewish ritual of circumcision. Of course, the Jews, the Pharisees in particular, said they've got to be circumcised and follow Moses' law just like we do. But the Apostle Peter stood up and addressed the body of believers gathered and told them in verse 9 that the rite of purification for Gentiles has become faith. Purify faith, not circumcision. Don't you just love Simon Peter? When he stands up, everybody listens. 
He's got something to say that people want to hear. Not only is purifying faith the way for the Gentiles to become children of God, but because of Jesus' death and the shedding of his blood for the remission of sins, it's the new and living way for all people everywhere, including Jews and Gentiles. You might wonder, well, how does faith purify my life? And if you ask, I'm glad you did, because I think I have something to share with you. In Greek language, this word that is used here and translated into English as purifying means to add something else, an admixture. And, and here's how to think about that. It's a completing ingredient that may be considered minor in content, but major or critical to completing the perfecting process. And faith was that ingredient. Circumcision is a cutting away of excess flesh that creates better hygiene and easier success in keeping a very sensitive area clean. In Judaism, it was and remains to be Jewish law for males who practice the religion. But in Christianity, faith acts as the knife that cuts away excess which corrupts our hearts and compromises our efforts to live for, love, and serve God. Faith takes away what keeps people out there from realizing we are living, loving, and serving God. It cuts away habit and practice that separates us from the plan God has for us. It establishes the correct route to our purpose and our destiny. It is why Paul says in Hebrews that faith, if I say faith, faith. is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He places emphasis on it in, in verse 6 by saying, but without faith, it is impossible to please God because he who comes to God must believe that he is first, but also that he rewards those who diligently seek after. Okay, but how does faith purify believers? Romans 2, 28 and 29, let me read those to you. Circumcision of the heart, for you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you've gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew whose heart is right with God and true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. Amen. Capital S. Yeah. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God and not people. That's from the New Living Translation. Okay. So what conclusions should we draw from this? One... The family you were born into does not guarantee anything except that you're a real person with a destiny and purpose waiting to be discovered. There are many people who live all their life and never discover their destiny nor their purpose because they don't go on that journey of faith. And that's the way you discover it. The second thing is that the practice of faith is more important than anything else. Think about that word, practice, practice, practice. Some people say practice makes perfect. It's more correct to say that practice makes permanent. And if you're practicing the wrong thing, you need to change it. What do they say about medical doctors? They are licensed to practice. practice. 
practice medicine. That means there's probably a variable, a hit and miss element there. And we get all upset when the doctor don't get it right, don't we? Yeah. We don't do that. Because <coughs> we are given the opportunity to practice our faith. As a believer, you're licensed by the scripture, by the grace of God, to practice faith. Do we always get it right? No. Mm -hmm. And I say, no. <laughs> True circumcision is not a matter of obeying the law, but rather a change of heart produced by the Spirit. In the New Testament, it's called repentance. Look at your neighbor and say, have you repented? Have you repented? <laughs> Circumcision may bring praise or favor from people, but circumcision of the heart brings praise and favor from God, our Heavenly Father. You know, the Jews could, could raise the issue of circumcision, circumcision and make their point about their practice. But God makes the point for us through the life we live when our heart has been circumcised. The difference between religion and Christianity is faith in God and His Word. Not in procedures or works of human hands. Remember, without faith it is impossible to please God because those who come to God must believe that He is and that He rewards those who diligently seek Him. You say that, last, that word again that, that we don't like. Diligently seek Him. Diligently. One more time. Diligently. Diligently. You know, if you are diligently seeking something, it don't mean that it's just, you know, I'll take it or leave it. No, I'm desperate for it. You got that part? I got to have it. Amen. I'm not going to settle for anything less. In this, in this, I see a relationship based upon trust. Trust. trust that God is going to do what He says He's going to do. Yes. And trust from God toward us that we are going to pursue according to His plan the destiny He has for us. I also see in this a fullness of life not attainable any other way. This is it. If you want to get everything you're supposed to have in life, then you better find faith. Because it will purify and perfect your way and help you to find what you're looking for in your life. Amen. And if you don't, don't be miserable somewhere else. Mm -hmm. yes. Amen. Yeah. Say, good preaching, Pastor. Good, good preaching. preaching. So I just I just asked the question: why accept the good instead of the great? Why accept the mediocre? Instead of the fabulous, Amen. faith helps you to have the fabulous, the great. Amen. Don't accept the good when you can have the great. God never meant for His people to get caught up with ritual and the practice of it. His desire toward them was to perfect a pathway that allowed them to have a heart to heart relationship with Him. I want you to think about that. God knew how desperate the human heart was, how wicked it was. He knew. And yet, He wanted to have a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with His people. So, He planted the seed in the minds of His people, the Jewish people, and their practice and keeping of that covenant with Him brought us to the place where Jesus died on the cross for the sins of Jewish people and for the sins of us all. Thank you, Lord. And, and it just it 
strikes me as incredible that even though the heart was desperately wicked, filled with sin, filled with rebellion against God, that is exactly where God wanted to be in the hearts of all people. It's where He wanted to be. More than anywhere else here on earth, He wanted to be in our hearts. And He still longs to be there. Circumcision presented the idea of pain to please God. Somebody says, well, when infants are circumcised, they don't feel pain. Well, why do they cry? Amen. Purifying faith assures its practitioner of divine power and presence within. It really is like the song says, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. Amen. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I didn't ask you to sing it, but it's all right. <laughs> Good. If personal happiness is your goal, then purifying faith won't work for you. If getting your life in line with God's will is your goal, purifying, purifying faith is the way to do that. Life is going to have some misery no matter what you do. Well, I, I don't want to hear that, Pastor. Well, get over yourself. Amen. Make moments of misery work for you, Amen. not against you. And just so that you know, I thought about that before I said it. I'm going to read you this verse again for the second time in the last two or three weeks. The Lord does not delay as though He were unable to act. He can do anything He wants to. So if He wants to rescue you from misery, He can do it. And he is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is. Now, this is what God is. This, you just don't want to miss this. This is what God is. Extraordinarily patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to. You better read your Bible. Shows up. And I, I don't have this in my nose, but I just kept telling you this. Repentance is a way of life. Yes. Don't ask her, but I mess up a lot. <laughs> and I have to repent a lot. But I live with her, and I know sometimes she repents too. Amen. And if you don't repent, there's a good place for you down here right now to start. Amen. It's not a bad thing. It's a turnaround. Amen. Amen. You were going in the wrong direction, and when repentance comes, you go in the right direction. Amen. Getting to the other side of trials is not the goal in trials. <laughs> Sometimes you're there and you think, Lord, is this ever going to end? <laughs> if your personal goal in trials of life is simply to get through it, you will never get to it, to what? To what God has designed in that trial for you to experience. Our goal in trial should be to learn what we can from them and perfect the way of God for us through the process. You might want to remember this. If you don't go through it and complete it, you will repeat it. If you don't go through it and complete it, you will repeat it. You know, my daddy taught me that. Son, you didn't get it right. Go back and lick your calf over. Say, well, what does that mean? You know, when, when mamas have little, mom cows have little calves, they're always licking their calves. Always licking them. 
I don't know what it is about it, but they just like licking their jacks. My daddy would say it. Well, actually, my daddy didn't say that, but I learned that from a, a guy named Carter Reed at the funeral home where I worked. He said, you didn't do that right, Dennis, and you've got to go back and lick your calf over. I knew what that meant. He taught me. <clears throat> Israel had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years because they hardened their hearts against God. They are perfect examples of so many people today who seem to live from day to day with no purpose and seek no personal destiny. To trust in what can be seen and not in the hope of a future, a better day. God wants people who aspire to greatness. He wants people who live up to the potential He invested in them. Yeah. That includes you and I. In God's economy, there are no little eyes. <clears throat> Only big you. The sky's the limit. God can use you and God will use you if you trust Him. If you by faith serve Him, you will do great things. A couple of things and I'm done. Real faith requires commitment that is very demanding and exacting on the participant. Easy greasy grace does not exist. It's not there. Life is real. Life is earnest. The grave is not its goal. By design, the divine creator gave you and I the gift of faith to believe in him and know him in a way that rewards our efforts as we journey through this life. He created you. He created me. And he gave us such intricate detail of life so that no one else in this world can be found with even the same fingerprints that you and I have. Yours ain't like mine, mine ain't like yours. Your English is probably better than mine, but you understand that. The fact, or rather that fact, has God written all over it. Do you know how many people are on the face of the earth? No, I don't either. And what that means, there's some more than I can count. But there's not two single people on the face of the earth who have the same fingerprints. Isn't that amazing? Only God, only a divine creator could give you and I that kind of distinction and individuality. To ignore the impact of the gift of biblical faith upon your life is to accept the ritual emptiness of religion. There's a temptation to go down that trail about religion right here. To neglect faith is to deny the most powerful, perfecting influence available to you today. My encouragement to you today is to put God at the center of your life. Make Him the King on the throne of your heart. Surrender and submit yourself to His Word and His way. If you're wondering how you can get started or how you can tap into purifying faith, it's really not complicated. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Yes. So why, why don't you give the Bible a hearing? Why don't you give the Bible a hearing? You say, well, I'm not a judge. Well, you need to do some judging here of yourself. Amen. And the Bible will help you correctly judge and understand your own personal life and what it is God has for you. It goes on to say that 
We are saved by grace through faith, which is a gift from God. We're not saved by works, but by faith. Then the scripture goes on to say, of all who accept God by faith, that we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. A little bit of paraphrase, but it's the same thing. The practice of faith is established and given to us in the Bible. Amen. See that word? Can you read that word? Mark? Holy Bible. Holy Bible. You're not going to find your faith in some church that preaches things on the edge of what this says. You're going to find your faith in the Word of God. Amen. That's where you're going to find it. You're going to find yourself right here in the Word of God. You're there. Amen. Faith leads us to our purpose and destiny in this life. But that's not all. Faith prepares, preserves, and perfects us for heaven while we're on this journey here on earth. It purifies us through our practice of it. <clears throat> it is that one ingredient, that, that one ingredient that seems small to so many because sometimes it's hard to understand. Sometimes it's hard to wrap our human minds around it. And it just seems so small compared to what we face and deal with in our lives. And yet the simple truth is we can please God by faith. We can please God by living the life the Scriptures tell us to live. Faith purifies us through our practice of it. I have this Bible in my hand a week or so ago. I was visiting with Sister Doris Bass and just had to leave by the way. She gave me this Bible. And I told her when she handed it to me, I don't really need a Bible. She said, well, if you don't, find someone to share it with. So I got this idea this morning. I wanted to bring it to church with me and offer it to anybody who needs a Bible, a copy of God's Word. It's large print. It's large print. <coughs> And depending on what your preference is, it's the good old King James. You know, the good old King James. And if, if you need a Bible, I'm going to offer it to you and tell you that in this Bible, there is everything you need to know about your life here on this earth that will get you from here to heaven. And while you're on the journey, Keep you hopping, skipping, and singing all the way. It's in here. It's here. We think we're going to find it in something on TV that some preacher is saying. We think we're going to find it by listening to Joel Osteen on Sirius Radio. And I listen to him all the time because he encourages me. I say, well, Pastor, why are you listening to Joel Osteen? Because I like him. If you don't, don't listen to him. Don't. Don't mess me up. <laughs> he encourages me. But I'm telling you, this is where you got to go. Where do you think Joel Osteen preaches from? All I'm telling you is this is where it's at. Make up your mind this morning that this is where you're going to go. This is the first witness you're going to listen to. Because it will help you to judge all other things that come into your life appropriately and deal with yourself according to this book and its plan. So, do I have any takers? Anybody need a Bible? Well, come get it. Just come get it. It's yours. It's yours. Amen. Let's pray right now. 
Cindy wants this Bible because she wants to find God's plan and God's will for her life. And she's tired of squinting and reading that small print in the other one she's got. <laughs> so do that. But Father, right now as our hands are stretched this way, Cindy becomes the sum of us all because our hearts need to be hungry for your word. So hungry that we've lost our shame. We've lost our willingness to sit back and let somebody else have what you have for us. We are so hungry, Lord, that we will seek your word. Seek to know you in the fullness of your pardoning grace. And seek to walk with you, Lord, through your word and by your spirit. Bless Cindy today, Lord. Bless each one of us today, Father. To find a hunger in our hearts for you, for your word, for the power of your word that makes a difference in our lives, that helps us to see our purpose and our place in you. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask for these blessings today for your people. Amen. 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 Unfailing love flows from his heart and heals my soul. In spite of who I am, he loves and makes me whole. I almost can't believe it's so. Give to me.